everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, March 24th, 2024. Who knew all along that the whole world and all of our lives would have been a much better place if Claire had been in it. <laughs> I mean, Eve. I mean, Claire. I'm sticking with Claire. I'm calling her Claire. <laughs> I can't change. <laughs> oh. So what did you guys think of Claire's dream birthday episode? It seems like most of the comments that I've seen already were from people who did not enjoy it. But you know me, I'm a lemonade maker. I liked it. I like when Y&R gets weird. And I feel like weird doesn't really need to make sense. Weird is supposed to be weird. And I find that to be kind of a nice... I don't know, vacation from the continuity and the need for everything to make sense. So it was a vacation for me. <laughs> and speaking of vacations, ah, oh, in a world where baby Eve was never presumed dead and in fact stolen, wow. Claire and Summer and Abby had a wild vacation in Cabo. <laughs> That's the best case scenario out of all of this, that amazing vacation in Cabo. I really wish we could have seen that. It sounds like Claire was the life of the party. And there are pictures to prove it. Wink, wink. I like the idea of Claire letting her hair down and getting wild. <laughs> okay, so the premise of the dream episode was that Claire falls asleep and has a dream that she is a Newman and has always been a Newman. She ends up going to the athletic club for what she thinks is a family dinner, but then later turns out that it is her birthday party. And one by one, all of the guests from her family arrive and they are all hurtling compliments her way. I mean, talking about what a cool, fun, smart, person she is. Like all the things that Eve turned out to be and all of the things that Claire doesn't feel that she is like accepted and loved. So this is her fantasy of what kind of person she would have become if she had had a chance to be raised by a loving mother and father, Colin Victoria, and if she had had a chance to be brought up in the supportive and loving environment that we all know the Newman family has been all about over the years. Cough, gag, gulp. <laughs> Enter Adam <laughs> in a waiter's uniform. <laughs> okay. Well, in Claire's fantasy, for some reason, Adam is still an outsider. Only worse for him, it's said that Eve actually turned Adam into the police, not once, but twice, somehow. And now his career is ruined. So the only job 
in the whole wide world for him <laughs> involves wearing a name tag and pouring champagne for the citizens of Genoa City. Now, this is puzzling because you'd almost think that as an outsider, Claire's fantasy would have included acceptance for all. But, uh, no. Um, <laughs> even in fantasy, Adam is a black sheep. <laughs> But I've actually really liked and appreciated that YNR has acknowledged the parallel between Adam and Claire and their characters and the fact that becoming a de facto Newman uh, does not make you a true Newman, that there's this, this idea that unless you're part of the original core crew, you're you're not going to be true. You're not the real deal. And I think this, the Adam part, was Claire's way of representing that in her mind, in her dream. Like, no matter how happy she is, and no matter how accepted she is right now, that there's always going to be a name tag waiting for her around the corner. And I think Adam in her dream, represented that too-good-to-be-true fear. And it's right. I mean, it is too good to be true because, you know, with unless you're part of the core crew, and sometimes even if you are, it's one false move and you are out. So that's just an insidious little thing that's in the back of her mind, I think. Now, shocker of the episode, if Eve had never been stolen, Cassie never would have died. Okay. So, okay, Eve was stolen in 1998. I looked that up. And then Cassie died in 2005. I don't know exactly what chain of events would have been happening there. Like how having a seven-year-old cousin would have changed Cassie's decision-making. But apparently it also led to Nick and Sharon being happily together. So, okay, I guess. <laughs> it's fun to imagine. I, I don't know. To me, I thought, okay, well, this little bit of the show, the whole Cassie Mariah gag, uh, just felt kind of like it was more about technology. Like, we want to show off this fancy new toy that we have. Because YNR must have received some kind of special access, new access to the visual FX department at Paramount or something. Because we have had a lot of green screen lately with the car rides and the house fire. And that's exactly what this was too. Maybe it's because they move studios. Maybe they don't have an, as much um, space for their sets. So maybe this new uh, department, new place that YNR moved to physically film had some kind of green, some green screen stuff set up and they're just making use of this. Um, so that's that's they were like, well, let's let's go ahead and do a double shot of Cameron Grimes with a different outfit uh, side by side. And, and 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 most notably, the biggest difference between Cassie and Mariah, they parted their hair on different sides. It was OK. I wasn't super impressed. It didn't evoke much in me. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I was kind of like, meh, OK. When it comes to the FX, though, what I liked better about the episode were those freeze frames. I thought that was really creepy because everyone in the background just froze at the dinner table at a certain point, right in the middle of talking or they were mid-talk or they were mid-food or whatever they were doing. It just went completely still and it was stiller than... A human can fake like it wasn't everybody just freezing and like okay everybody 
<laughs> okay, everybody, freeze. It was, it, that had to be in effect because it was way, it was, it couldn't be faked. It was too still. And to me, that felt very eerie. And it was, I think, meant to be eerie because that launched us into Claire's nightmare. Claire's dream kept creeping or it was a nightmare that kept creeping into a wonderful dream and the nightmare was most represented by Jordan uh, standing there looking all gorgeous and black and giving faces and big hand motions all over the place the way that Jordan does. And Jordan actually kept showing up throughout the party and Claire kept pushing her away, pushing the thoughts away. And I liked, by the way, how the lighting really reflected that. The birthday party, when everybody was happy and talking and chopping it up, it was really well lit. And then all of a sudden, the lights would completely drop out. And then Jordan is in the shadows with a single spotlight on her. And then Claire has a single spotlight on her. And it just, it really added to the fantasy. I just want to say that, I think YNR's lighting team is always spectacular. It always, the lighting always enhances the experience, and this was really no exception. But um, I, at a point, Claire started realizing that pushing Jordan away and just sort of like, eh, I don't want to think about it, wasn't working for her. Because Jordan would just always end up coming back. So Claire realized that she had to face Jordan. She had to face her fear. She had to face her past. She had to face it all. And so she left the frozen faces at the birthday party and went downstairs to confront Jordan in the jazz lounge where the bloody tear doll was propped up on a pedestal. Ugh. 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 I just wish somebody would get rid of that prop now. Can we be done with that prop now? <laughs> I mean, I'm real glad you decided to bring it full circle and everything, but I need to never see that doll again. <laughs> no more bloody tears, please. <laughs> I guess Claire is the doll. Is that the idea? <laughs> Well, Claire tells Jordan to go to hell, and um, she pretty much, you know, rebukes every single doubt that Ghost Jordan tries to put into her head, and it works, and then Jordan vanishes, and then Claire returns to her birthday party feeling pretty good about herself, but... Not before she gets one final warning from Adam. And what he said to her was, Okay, I see you. You have a dark streak. And if you ever decide to let it out, you will be a force to be reckoned with. Oh, goody. <laughs> Kind of looking forward to that, cause you know the nice cake and her and the uh, the nice cake at the party and the party dresses and the smiley faces and all of that's really nice and good. But I do kind of miss bad Claire, and I do kind of look forward to the day that the Newmans end up not accepting her, and uh, the day that she f ends up fulfilling the black sheep prophecy that I think she and Adam are both foreshadowed to share because I can see all of this has foreshadowing all over it and not just with Adam in the dream but with Summer in reality too and with Nick in reality too if Claire thinks that she's just gonna ice skate through life now just because she's a Newman then she needs to go back to the mental health facility for a few more months.
Rule number one of soap opera, nobody not dead. <laughs> if there is nobody, the person is not dead. And rule number two, by the way, even if there is a body, still not dead. <laughs> so, nope, nope, not buying it. <laughs> Jordan will never die. <laughs> she will live forever, <clears throat> even if it's off screen. <laughs> You know what I like best about Jordan? She does everything on her own terms. Oh, you think you've won? You think you've bested me? Well, I would rather kill myself than let you win. And so that's what she did. Supposedly. Sigh. Nikki and Victoria and Claire insisted to Victor that they needed to go to the dungeon to confront Jordan and they and to see her there, I guess. They wanted to see her trapped like a rat in a cage. And, you know, one by one, they all had their say with her. But Jordan had the final say. <laughs> Don't forget, ladies, I prepped this room. I was going to lock you and Victor in here and give you the ultimate way out. But I have a vial of blue liquid here. It's a little vial of blue liquid that's three times more potent than any other poison that I gave you at the lake house. Yes, that's right. I was holding out the first time at the lake house, and I've been saving this triple poison for an even more special occasion. <laughs> Ta -ta. <laughs> and then she drinks it, and then she dies. Right in front of everyone. <laughs> No attempt to rescue her. They all just stood there and watched her die. <laughs> and then they turned on their heels and left that hunky security guard to dispose of the body all by himself. Rude. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> Uh, uh, but you see, Jordan prepped that room, okay? And I happen to know that that was not triple strength poison. That was just some Dawn dish soap mixed with water, okay? She's alive. <laughs> She's alive and she was fooling you. You new coven of Newman witches, and you fell for it. <sighs> I am feeling a lot better about the whole Connor thing. Oh, Connor's not feeling better, but I am, and that's what's important. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here's the story. Okay, okay. Here's the conflict. I get it now. The conflict is Chelsea versus Adam. What do we do about Connor? What do we do about our son? Therapist says, send him to mental health camp. <laughs> Mental health camp will do the trick. And Chelsea agrees. And by the way, can I get five minutes of your time to talk through my feelings about all of this? <laughs> I know you're my son's therapist, but can I just get a couple minutes for myself? <laughs> 
You cannot say no after I tell you about my suicide attempt. <sighs> now, Adam says, bring the kid home. Because you know your kid has got problems when even the special mental health school can't deal with him. When the special school for depressed kids says, we don't know what to do. Send him there. Send him away. <laughs> okay, well, now here's the thing. <clears throat> it's real easy to judge someone's parenting from the outside. When you're not living it. It's real easy to dispense advice and not have to follow through with anything. Because it's not your life. But I'm going to do that anyway. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and dispense that advice. Even though I'm not living it and I don't have to follow through with it anyway. <laughs> what is what is this not for if not a soapbox? Uh. It seems to me like the idea to send him to a camp would be fine. I don't think it would hurt to give Connor some very specific coping skills that are targeted toward kids with OCD. Nothing wrong with that. But then... Chelsea and Adam absolutely need to bring Connor home. He is asking to come home. And Adam wants to respond to that request immediately. And really, I mean, I think the middle ground here is kind of easy to see. Like, bring him home for a week or two. So just do that immediately. Bring Connor home immediately Give him some loving. No school. Forget about school. And no work for the parents. You're rich. Take a couple of weeks off. Just bring Connor home and have some low-key family chill time. That's step one. Family chill time. Okay. Then, after a couple of weeks have gone by, then send him to the camp program for, you know, a few weeks. Bring him home on weekends. But let him finish up. Let him get them coping skills. Okay, they, let's do that part. That's what the therapist recommended. Let's do that. But then when the program is done, bring him home, homeschool him, and most importantly, give him a part-time job at Newman Enterprises. Put him to work. Let him put some stamps on some envelopes at Newman Enterprises. Have him shadow Adam on the job. Then flip him over to Marchetti. Let him shadow Chelsea there too. Like let Connor practice these coping skills in some real world scenarios under the supervision of his parents. And let Connor see how his parents cope in the real world. Adam and Chelsea can be talking him through stuff on the fly as it comes up. Because kids don't know how to cope if the parents don't know how to cope or if the parents don't know how to teach them. And if everyone has to learn together, adults and children together learning, then so be it. That's my two cents. <laughs> That's my way. The middle way. <laughs> What do you guys think is the way? I think that's a really good poll question for us this week, chatters. What do we do about our little Connor? Whyarchat.com. That's the poll question for the week. Little Con is in trouble. Let us embrace him into the Y in our chat collective bosom and Get him set on the right path starting now. Your detective skills are very impressive. That was our quote from last week. And the answer is Summer. Summer was talking to Phyllis. And Phyllis pieced together that 
she and Chance had just had a sleepover. And Summer says, yeah, your detective skills are very impressive, Mom. <laughs> I thought that was a funny moment. So shout outs go to Ron, Hannah, Justin, Dolores, wonderful Wendy, Henry, Sharon W., Victoria, Tony, Tanya, Brittany, and Daisy. Thank you guys for your correct responses. I think you did good on that one. I thought it was going to be harder. And I'm like, how am I going to find a quote this week that will be a challenge? Because there's only three episodes. But I kind of like this. Kind of like this one. <clears throat> you tell me if you know who said it. Time has given me clarity. Time has given me clarity. Who said it? If you think that you know. Go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. And if you get it right, I will give you your shout out during next week's YNR Chat. And now on to the good stuff, which is your comments. Starting out with the Claire's Dream Fantasy episode. Sharon W. mentions how beautiful that birthday table looked and the cake looked delicious i might be tempted to join the dysfunctional newman family just for those fancy perks alone and i wanted to mention that it was fun to see how ynr changed victor and nikki's clothes and hair made them look a little younger i enjoyed it and Summer was great today also, showing that she could pull off more of a comedy demeanor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Tanya said, I actually also enjoyed this episode. It was fun to watch. It was great to see the characters being happy instead of just the usual drama. Um, this episode gave us a break from the drama. Yeah, I like that too. I like I like the break. I like when it gets weird. I, I don't want it to be weird every day, but I I'm all for why and are trying new things to try to keep the show a, you know a little different. I mean, we got to keep evolving it, and I don't mind the occasional just weird dream fantasy. Uh, T. Nicole says, I noticed a hiccup in the Claire dream sequence. In Claire's dream, they imply that Nick and Sharon never broke up as Cassie's still alive. Yet, yeah, Summer was there. Uh, Summer was a product of Nick cheating on Sharon with Phyllis due to Cassie dying. So how was Summer born in the reality if Claire Eve was raised in the Newman family? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a that's definitely like a okay. <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but okay. Dolores says, as I thought and thought about Claire's dream and the many sequences of relationships shown positively and negatively, I finally think I understand why. She is truly a Newman without any baggage. Not Claire, but Eve. No doubt anymore, no interferences, no loss or misplaced memories or family love, no outsider. I am accepted and I belong and there's a family picture to prove it. Yes, yeah, she, it's like she's, she's um, I think, hoping that she is receiving a, a blank slate, but I don't know. I just think that it's all foreshadowing a not so easy path for her. Sharon W. says, I enjoyed Nick being able to have a valid dialogue today. He was able to express his fears and anger about the way that Claire has now been completely accepted by the Newman family. It seems like an impending breakdown between Nick and Victoria is in the future. Victoria will fight for Claire. However, Nick will be guarded at accepting Claire without exception. Also, Summer is now in the information loop by knowing what the Newmans had to go through at Jordan's cabin. She and Nick will remain wary along with Kyle and Adam. 
yeah, I like that. I need there to be some challenge to this instant acceptance. And I don't think Claire, I mean, I, I feel like Claire's dream is was also meant to show us that, yeah, she's a good guy now. She's committed to the Newman. She's not um, scheming or anything or whatever. But then we had Adam's foreshadowing of, you know, I know there's a dark side in there. So, so Claire's good now, you guys, but you never know when that might change. <clears throat> Tony says, I would like to see Summer and Chance marry and file for custody of Harrison and Dominic. That might bring some drama away from the arguments over the CEO chair and set up a storyline way into the future for new brothers. Yeah, that's kind of a good idea. I like that. Harrison and Dominic um, as you know, future new, new brothers for the show. That's a good one. Um, Tina Cole says, I really enjoyed the Aunt Jordan storyline, but where was the major climax? I was expecting an ending like how they did Sharon and Cameron Kirsten. I wanted someone to jump in front of someone and save them from a gunshot or something. And we didn't even see the aftermath of Jordan drinking the poison. Where was the cops and the paramedics? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, it's left on such a, huh, no, that's, I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't bother me too much only because that helps fuel my theories that Jordan is still alive and she can come back at any moment and I feel like she's going to mwahaha around the corner anytime now. But yeah, I mean, after she took the poison and laid down and that was the cliffhanger, I thought, Okay, well, I wonder what tomorrow's going to be like. Uh, are we going to resuscitate her? Are we going to call the cops? Like, what's going to happen? And then it was just literally nothing. Everybody comes home and they're like, wow, can't believe Jordan killed herself like that. <laughs> no, no follow-up. I mean, really, truly, uh, no calling of the police, nothing. And that brings me to this brilliant comment from Gary who says, uh, there's a manhunt out for the convict who burned down the local Oregon state prison and the Newmans owe it to the state to relieve local tension in informing them that they have their man. <laughs> Could Aunt Jordan possibly be a man? Or have a disguise for a man? <laughs> that really made me laugh. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a nationwide, statewide, and nationwide manhunt going on for Aunt Jordan, and the Newmans know exactly what happened to her, and they're letting those resources be wasted, not informing the police about her. Maybe there's more going to come to this later in the week. Maybe Victor will reveal. I don't know, but it is a big head scratcher there. And Naomi says... I actually let this show make me cranky this week. The Newman women locked arms, Laverne and Shirley style, and comforted each other for the ordeal of watching Jordan poison herself. How about calling 911? How about telling the police maybe a security officer from the mall uh, Jordan's location? How about just getting over your trauma inflicted by Jordan and putting it in the rearview mirror? But we see these three deliberately seeking to spend time with a mad woman. I may have to quit watching this show if I'm still upset on Monday. <laughs> Are you still upset, Naomi, or did it, does it pass? Because I usually, I'm always like, blah. On, if, on an episode I don't like, I'm usually like, uh. But then the next day I'm fine and <laughs> I'm watching again. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. There is no such thing as I'm going to stop watching the show. <laughs> We're addicted. <laughs> We're addicted and we know it. Uh, maybe holding out hope, though, that maybe there'll be a little more follow-up on that. But then again, like, I keep hoping there's going to be some kind of follow-up on Victoria's whole house burning down. I feel like that was not made big enough of a deal of. <sighs> well, Daisy says, I think hope that Jordan saying she had poison was a red herring, and what she actually took was leftover antidote that she had. I don't think she's dead, though. I think she's pretending so that she can use that moment as a means to escape, yeah. Uh, when she escaped jail, Jordan may have contacted someone and set up a plan if they didn't hear from her. So the next person who opens the locked door is Jordan's rescue party, and her rescuer is 
Sheila Carter. Jordan had helped Sheila fake her death, and Sheila's now returning the favor with a rescue. The two will then leave together and plot their revenge, not right away, but when those they believe hurt them least expect it. Ooh, I love that, Daisy. Ah, Jordan helps Sheila fake her death, and so Sheila helps Jordan fake hers. I, but I also think you totally hit the nail on the head in that she, Jordan faked her own death so that then they would haul her out of there and she could slip away. That was the only way she was going to get out. She's not dead. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. Not dead. Oh, hey, Sue W. says, I thought Cameron Grimes did a subtle but effective job differentiating between Cassie and Mariah. It wasn't evident in the dialogues, but rather in the body languages and expressions. And of course, true to character, Mariah has bolder makeup, and that did help differentiate it also. And kudos also again to Haley Aaron. In my opinion, she is an engaging actress, and I hope she stays on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. There's a little positive note from Sue W. Really liking that um, that double effect and, and the way it was used with Cassie and Mariah. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, so there's double uh, Cameron Grimes, and also there's, at my count, maybe about three Ashleys now. Victoria says, how many suspicious abbots will it take to realize that Ashley is not herself? Can all the Ashleys band together to throw off her family doubts. If not, Ashley's old-fashioned and cherry days will be numbered. And this is interesting from Sherrod, who says, I think Ashley has three personalities, and one of them is a child. Ooh, Sherrod, that is awesome, because that really explains the bro bomb heard round the world, the epic failure of Ashley calling Billy bro. Like it is kind of a childish or a teenager thing to say. And Sharon W says, I don't know why I didn't see that before. I loved how Ashley was acting at the bar while talking to Billy, swinging around on her stool and giggling. And I agree, there are now three personalities, but I just pictured Ashley portraying a childlike adult acting silly and trying to hang on to her youth. You know, you're as young as you feel type of character. And I agree completely that one of the personalities is a child. I had to rewatch that scene so I could enjoy it more. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, that is really good. I didn't even think about that. But, I mean, yeah, now I'm going to have to see that. Because it does seem like there's um, a middle Ashley, a very souped-up sexy Ashley, and then there's this child-like one. Great, great observation. Uh, Daisy says, I think that the accident triggered something in Ashley, but I don't think she's experiencing other personalities. I think it may be aspects of herself from different times in her lives. Um, Billy would not have known Ashley as a teenager, so she very well could have used the word bro back then. She's Ashley, but who she is now and what happened with Tucker became so abhorrent to her that her mind is reverting to her own past, her own life, but at different ages. And she's now doing that to protect herself from becoming an amnesiac and losing herself completely, particularly since John isn't there to help her recover this time. And if this is happening, then Jack might be able to figure it out, but I think it's more likely that Mamie will, as she was like a mother to her for a number of years, so she would remember Ashley's personality and behavior then and see the similarities to how she's acting now. Oh, yeah, Daisy, oh, I like the idea that Mamie needs to weigh in on all of this, that she might be uh, the one to figure it out. I don't know, you, but yeah, it is right. It's like, how when are, when are, when is someone in the family going to really see this? So far, nobody has really cued in on it except Tucker. Well, Diana says, I feel like I may be alone in this opinion, but I don't like seeing Ashley having the split personality disorder. I would much rather have Ashley be her sane, sexy self and trying to win back Tucker's heart just as he tried to win her heart when he first came back to Genoa City. I'd love to see a triangle between Ashley, Audra, and Tucker that is fair game. 
I feel like it would be more fun to watch and entertaining as opposed to seeing Ashley being manipulative and conniving as she pulls out all the stops to break up Audra and Tucker and have him all to herself. Ultimately, Ashley has broken up the pair, but I don't want to see it play out this way. I hope that the plan is that we'll see her in the near future get the help that she needs. And side note, last week, Allie mentioned that Ashley may have a brain tumor. And if this is the case, then Wyanart is repeating history as this storyline was already done when Ashley was married to Tucker when he was being portrayed by Stephen Nichols. I remember Tucker was having a business press conference and he had to cover up Ashley's medical problem as they didn't want anyone to know. Ooh, Diana, I didn't remember that at all, but that's interesting. You know what? I do maybe, I kind of maybe do remember Ashley having some kind of brain tumor before or something. Oh, all right. So maybe we are uh, repeating or maybe it's not a brain tumor at all. I don't know. But it's interesting that you're not feeling the, the split personality. You'd rather, you like the triangle, but you'd rather it be an even match. Well, okay. Now we got to talk about Connor. <laughs> And why in our chat comments about Connor? And here's my favorite one. It's from Henry, who says, I can't understand the OCD scenario. I was brought up and remember just getting an old-fashioned ass whipping if we got on our parents' nerves. They had their own diagnosis of strange behavior, and the cure was just whipping your butt. This is the old saying, spare the rod and spoil the child. Oh, Henry, this, this was the comment of the week for me. Um, not going to lie. I saw this and I just lit up because I understand the spirit in which you intended this comment. The idea that all Connor needs is just a good old fashioned spanking. <laughs> That made me laugh because it just took the whole plot and all of the head spinning and all of the what do we do and it just laid it down flat. What's he need? Spanking. <laughs> Ooh. But I only condone spanking between consenting adults. And only between the hours of 8 and 11 p.m. And never on religious holidays because God could be watching. <laughs> uh, Sherrod says, I feel the lack of discipline is what's wrong with the youth of today. And also, it seems that Connor may be blaming his OCD on his parents. I found that question to Adam about his time playing cards in Vegas as Spider very interesting. I still believe Connor is faking it. Ooh, Sherrod, you think Connor's faking it? Yeah, I mean, let's not forget the fact that kids can be manipulative. Yeah. Well, Gary says, Connor's OCD is a tempest in a teapot. I don't like to see Connor picking at himself. No, wait. Gary called him Con. I don't like to see Con picking at himself. <laughs> Certainly. But if he likes to line up the books in the orderly way, then he needs to line up the books in the orderly way. Just come to my house. No, my books are already orderly by subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, crazy OCD is very livable. Who out there washes their hands? Connor, you don't need education from a university for depressives, and you don't need OCD school either. Walnut Grove will do you just fine. OCD doesn't make you a crackpot. <laughs> yeah, Gary, I know. I mean, it's like we all have these things. We all have these ticks and it's I mean it's clear that Connor's going through it, that it's bigger than I think you know I don't know I mean I think adults get to a point where it's like okay we logically know that we're we're being you know too picky about the certain things in our life but again it's just like Connor is not being given coping skills all of these things are just Connor's way of trying to make himself feel safe in a world where he where, where he doesn't feel safe he's trying to control things that are beyond his control 
Um, and that's just life. That's just what it is. And, uh, you know, he's not being educated. He's not, he's not about the coping skills. And there's just no school that's going to do that for him. It is something that has to come from the family. It's something that has to come from the parents. It has to be taught, not only taught, but demonstrated. And that is not what we're, we're getting here with Khan. Naomi says, I know lots of kids with OCD-like behavior, and the parents gently or not so gently encourage them to knock it off. Kids are capable of knocking it off if someone tells them that it will cause them problems if they don't. Connor is a whiny kid because nobody tells him to be otherwise. Just once, a soap parent needs to say the truth to these kids. Nobody likes a whiner. Nobody likes a kid that counts and puts his hood in strings <laughs> to a certain count. Knock it off or kids will tease you and you won't have any friends. Plain language works many times. <laughs> you know, the other thing I like, I'm starting to like about this story <clears throat> is that it is kind of creating this discussion about like old school parenting versus new school parenting. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I, I suppose I, I parent a little bit somewhere in the middle I because I, I don't spank my daughter. Uh, but, you know, I think I do kind of do more of the plain talk because, I mean, I if she's whining, I tell her to knock it off. You know, I am very plain language with her. So um, it's just interesting and probably mostly to me because I've got a kid at around this age. Uh, and so it's interesting to it, – well, and I'm constantly observing the ways that I was raised versus the way that I'm raising her because I got spanked. I got smacked. Um, and I know many of you probably did too, cause that was just sort of the way. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I've made the conscious decision to, to not, to not do that. Um, but you know, I'm constantly, even when it comes to like schooling and stuff, it's like, what, this is what they're teaching in school versus like what I got taught in school. Cause I'm certain that I didn't get, get taught that in school. And so it's like, you know, I'm happening, I'm happening to observe the, a lot of the old school versus new school, um, child raising parenting type stuff. And so maybe this is especially interesting to me now. And I didn't like this storyline at first. And now I'm like, oh, okay, this is actually uh, pretty good. Oh, and another observation I can offer too is that now like uh, some schools, not all schools, but they do teach social emotional learning skills. And I don't know if it's happening more now in a post COVID world, but there are like, cause I don't know if like enough parents aren't doing it at home these days or what, but there are, they are incorporating that into uh, elementary schools now where you're cut, where you're covering topics like self control and honesty and empathy and, you know, other kind of like value based, I guess, units. So that, that is there in school now where, uh, as where I, I'm certain I did not have a social emotional learning, like identifying your, emo no kidding, identifying your emotions and trying to give kids tools on how to deal with them, which I think is wonderful. Yes, because obviously it's it's not happening at home, um, <clears throat> and even but even if it is happening in school, it needs to be reinforced at home, and maybe that's not what's happening. What's not happening with Connor? But Dolores says the father and son moments between Adam and Connor were priceless. Adam has shown more patience, love, and understanding to him as he Connor struggles with OCD and is so noteworthy. Adam deserves a Best Father Award for now and even for his parenting of his sons, even given up his parental rights to Christian in the past, and he's always tried to do what's best for them. Uh, yeah, I know. It was hard, you know, to not uh, connect to that story or that part when Adam and Connor were together because it was like, yes, just sitting down with the kid, giving him a hug and listening to what he needs. What's the kid telling you that he needs? Well, the kid's saying, I want to come home, dad. And without talking about it with Chelsea, Adam just says, yes, son. And um, I mean, that's probably what I, I mean, I want to say that's probably what I would do too. But you can see where the story is being set up that, oh no, Adam didn't check with Chelsea about this. And Chelsea's had the conversation with the therapist where she feels very firmly that therapy is the route, that that's what's best for him because it's been what's best for her. It's what helped her. 
Um, and I think that Chelsea too has had, you know, those moments with Connor where it's very bonding and like, hey, son. And she was the one at first, the only one that was with him in his therapy session. So Chelsea's doing the momming too. She just has a certain idea of what's going to be the best route. And Adam maybe is going to have a different idea of what's going to be the best route. And really, again, like I said, I feel like there's a very easy middle ground in between. But I think instead of the middle ground, we're going to end up seeing a battleground. Victoria says, The arc of Adam's acceptance of Connor's diagnosis has been treated realistically. In the beginning, he wanted to blame the school for Connor's struggles and pull him out. He felt that there had to be someone or something responsible. And then next, he agreed to testing and professional help. And all along the way, he has tried to find answers and handle the pull of Connor's fears. He has also used the old parent's distraction of favorite foods. Accepting a difficult diagnosis diagnosis of your child is hard, and I'm glad Adam has been written as a caring father who's willing to question himself and do what's best for his son. Yeah, oh, Victoria, see, this is great because it is also like, okay, well, as parents we who were who were children in a different age where the parents like would just get you're acting weird whooping you know i mean like that's where we came from probably all of us listening to this came from like the school of whooping <laughs> the school of you ain't acting right here's your spanking so yes that's me too we, we come from that and then to now be in a different world raising kids, maybe Adam is representing that a little bit where he's like, well, wait a minute, this is like not how, I don't understand this. We're, you know, him, as Victoria says, sort of not understanding Connor's diagnosis, maybe wanting to blame his school, like really not knowing where to put this information. Like I didn't have this problem, so why would my kid have this problem? And then he's kind of evolved along the way of acceptance and uh, and trying and, and, and yeah, and we're seeing an evolution in Adam too. Uh, and I guess maybe the solution too is just everybody works together and we all evolve together and we all talk it out and have some more family time. I mean, maybe that might have something to do with it too. A lack of family time. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, uh, family time, maybe possibly growing families like dad and dad's girlfriend, I asked you guys Last week, if you liked the idea of an Adam Sally Audra triangle, I can't believe you guys, 69% of you voted no to the Adam Audra Sally triangle. You don't like that idea? Only 31% of you saying, yeah, let's have it. Well, Tony says sometimes these triangles are just plopped in where there's no storyline and they don't make sense. And that just puts off the viewers. Well, maybe that's it, Tony. Maybe it's just that it's like, okay, well, where'd that come from? I don't need it. And so that justifies the no vote. Well, that or you guys only voted no to the Sally Adam Audra triangle because what you're really holding out for is the Nikki Adam Sally triangle instead. Okay, everybody. This has been an interesting short week. Hey, Christy, happy birthday. <laughs> I feel bad that you your birthday came on a week where there was only three episodes of YNR. I hope that that doesn't spoil it for you. But Monday, I think we're right back to a full week of YNRs. So happy birthday, Christy. I hope I hope uh, Monday's YNR really brings you uh, the, around the full circle on the birthday joy. I hope you have a good one. Um, yeah, you know the the three the March Madness catches me off guard most times. Nine out of ten years, it catches me completely off guard because I watched all I watched Monday and Tuesday's episode, and then I heard something. Totally unrelated, somebody mentioning the March Madness, and I thought, oh, the only thing March Madness means to me is a short <laughs> week of Y&R. <laughs> and I heard that on Tuesday, and I was like, crap, does that mean there's only one more episode left? And sure enough, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday shows, and then like, oh, darn, I got to find something else to fill my time on Thursday and Friday. But the truth is, I just went back and watched the episodes again. <laughs> Uh, like I said, addicted. I think YNR might be part of my uh, my compulsive.
behavior. Like, I got to watch it, and then I got to take this very right screen cap episodes, and I got to get the very, I have to get the exact right screen cap for everything. Um, okay, well, short week of YNR, but this is a pretty full-length YNR chat, and oh yeah, by the way, the reason I'm not doing video today is because I'm having a mattress delivered today, and I'm so excited about it, but like, they gave me the delivery window, and I, it's early, and I thought, well, shoot, I better, I don't want to get caught off guard, like, they're supposed to call and say when, when they're going to be here, and I didn't want to be taking phone calls and be on video and doing the whole YNR chat and have to get up and take a phone call and then break my flow. So I'm just like doing this real early and getting it done. And then I'm going to uh, wait patiently for my brand new mattress. <laughs> so excited because my old one's like sinking in right in the spot where my butt goes. <laughs> Which is very upsetting. I don't know why. I don't know why it would be that my my butt's sinking in there. It couldn't be because my butt's giant. <laughs> uh, I got a big old muscly butt just like sinking down my mattress. I got to get a new one. <laughs> so it just messes everything up. It messes up my back alignment and everything. So anyway, that's my priority today. Sorry, why in our chat? I my mattress is my is my top priority. So. I am sneaking this chat in, and then I'm just going to be sitting there waiting by the window for my new mattress. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, is what I will sit and watch every episode of YNR on. Always in bed. YNR, I watch in bed. So my mattress comfort is, it is paramount to my YNR and therefore YNR chat experience. So I hope you understand. Okay, everybody, I hope that you have a wonderful five episodes of YNR Week ahead. I love you, and I will see you next Sunday. Bye.